This is a support presentation for the lesson on Eisenhower in Vietnam, 1953 to 1961, the beginning of the quagmire. Please pause when prompted to stop the presentation. The aims of this presentation then. What policies did Eisenhower pursue in Vietnam during his presidency? And to what extent was Eisenhower responsible for the US involvement in Vietnam, which would subsequently arise? Quagmire theory. Successive presidents took one step after another, thinking each step would be the one to solve the Vietnam problem. The US got deeper and deeper into the quagmire, literally a muddy marsh from which they could not escape. Remember, Eisenhower inherited a commitment to Vietnam from Truman through the Truman Doctrine linking back to the French involvement in Indochina and their failure to hold on to Indochina after Dien Bien Phu. Truman had been providing the French with economic and military aid in their war against the Viet Minh. Eisenhower in Vietnam Eisenhower believed that the loss of Vietnam to communism would affect the global balance of power. His belief in domino theory was one inherited from Truman, and he was an ardent, a strident anti-communist. He very much saw any gain for the communist bloc as a loss for him. He feared that if Vietnam fell to communism, other East Asian countries would follow. They thought this had been already illustrated in Korea. They'd already experienced it in China. Remember, the who lost China argument was one that was very much levelled at Truman as a means of winning him out of the White House. He felt Vietnam was vitally important to the United States because of the following. Its productions of material and economic base in Southeast Asia. The Viet Minh were pro pro proposing to establish a dictatorship in Vietnam, and he believes in the domino theory. Please pause. However, Eisenhower was unclear on what the US should do in Vietnam. He said that no military victory is possible in that kind of theatre. He considered it easier to pay others to help contain communism. Then obviously we see this played out by Truman's role in Vietnam and supporting the French economically. There was debate within his administration, within his government, about the relative importance of Vietnam. Some felt that Vietnam was devoid of decisive military objectives and involvement there was a pointless diversion of US resources. Obviously illustrating ambiguity and a lack of clarity on what the United States was going to do with Vietnam. Please pause. After the Geneva Conference, the US did not want free elections to take place, which was part of the agreement reached at Geneva. They were very much of the opinion that a popular election would see the return of Ho Chi Minh to a national victory in Vietnam, therefore uniting both North and South Vietnam, facilitating, therefore, the domino theory. Just in this case, it would happen to be democratically. Diem, the Prime Minister of Vietnam, felt that the answer to the problem was to build a, South, a stable South Vietnamese state. Division along the 17th parallel was a problem because that would leave Viet Minh strongholds well within South Vietnam. It was well known that there was popular support for Ho Chi Minh south of the 17th parallel. Please pause. Diem's government then, the ruling government of South Vietnam, he's seen here on the left meeting Eisenhower and Foster Dulles, Eisenhower's Secretary of State. He came to US attention due to his militant anti-communism, so a very strong advocate of pro-Americanism in Vietnam. The US were not 100% happy with the choice of Diem. Dulles admitted that the US supported Diem, Diem because there was no better candidate, not because he was the best candidate. Diem was wholly dependent upon the United States for support. French commitments to Vietnam dried up after Diem Bien Phu. In October 1955, Diem beat Bao Dai in a referendum to choose a president to lead a new republic of Vietnam, the RVN. 
He was able, from his position of wealth, to buy support from religious sects due to US money that he was using for himself. The United States actively encouraged Diem not to pursue the idea of free elections in 1956. This went against the United States' desire to defend democracy throughout the free world. This was clearly then a pragmatic stance taken by the United States. He wasn't the best man, he wasn't the right man, he was openly corrupt, but what he stood for was an opposition and a barrier to the successful spread of communism. If it went against the pure ideas of democracy and freedom that America stood for, then so be it. Please pause. Other problems then with the M's regime. He was nepotistic. He gave key positions in the government to his family. There was a Catholic bias on his part. He gave government jobs to Catholic rather than the Buddhists in Vietnam who were in the majority. This is illustrating that Diem came from that French Catholic minority elite that evolved during the time of, China, of French rule in Indochina. He limited freedom of speech, opposition parties were outlawed, and he was dependent upon US aid. He alienated the peasants in the countryside. The standards of living remained extremely poor, and Saigon did little to address the problems of excessive rent levels and unequal distribution of land. This will have critical long-term consequences for the United States in the war that they will subsequently inherit. As with the French, they were able to hold down the cities and the urban population, but not the rural population. Criticism in Diem's government was punishable by detention in a concentration camp. Between 55 and 59, 12,000 executions took place for suspected communists, and 50,000 people were sent to the camps for re-education. He disregarded the fate of innocent in the pursuit of those deemed guilty. This policy increasingly alienated the rural populations and those in the towns and cities from the Saigon regime. Please pause. Kevin Wan, in his book War and Revolution in Vietnam, 1930-75, quote, Washington inadvertently gave Diem the means to protect what was in all key respects a dictatorship. Instead of the showcase democracy it hoped to create in South Vietnam, the US found itself underwriting a police state. Please pause. Yet their commitment to this state overrode their principles of a belief in democracy and freedom. It was a pragmatic gesture. To prevent the spread of communism was more important. Remember how the fall of China, how perceived weakness for Truman in Korea, had ushered in, essentially, the end of Democrat rule in the United States. Please pause. Other US policies, then. Until 1959, South Vietnam was fairly peaceful. To ensure it remained pro-Western and anti-communist, the US poured in economic aid, $7 billion between 1955 and 1961, a substantial amount of money today, yet alone in the 1950s. Additionally, modern weapons and military advisers were sent in. Key that this is under, underscored there on the presentation, because the military advisers would be something that would be expanded into a combat role in due course. In 1954, 17 officers with sealed orders were sent to Vietnam. When Eisenhower left office in, in the end of his second term, the number of advisers were around 685, and around 1,500 military personnel in all were in Vietnam. This is clearly an escalation, though nowhere near on the scale that would happen in subsequent administrations. At this point, military personnel were not there to fight, but to train the ARVN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, to use conventional weapons to combat an expected invasion from the north. In 1955, Washington took full responsibility for the financial and, um, financing and training of the South Vietnamese armed forces. Now, we're still a long way, therefore, from American boots on the ground, as they were in Korea. But the process is drifting, the process is escalating. From a verbal commitment, from financial and economic aid under Truman, to advisers and cash, to an extension of the role of the advisers and increasing military support. Please pause. 